under the Controlled Substances Act and Corollary State Law, the growth, trafficking, sale, possession, or consumption of psychedelics may be a felony punishable by imprisonment, fines, forfeiture of property, or some combination thereof. Psychedelic X is for general information only. Information provided on the show does not constitute legal advice, nor does your listening to the show create an attorney-client relationship with the host. Hello, I'm attorney Gary Smith, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Psychedelic Alex, The Law of Psychedelics, my ongoing exploration of the question of the law of psychedelics. Even though at first glance it seems like, oh, well, that can't be safe, but I think in terms of bringing people through a process, it actually is, in some instances, a, a safe thing to do, right? Yeah. Um, but again, and, and I'll say so, this about SoulQuest, is that they have tons of other people there who are there to assist people. Um, and, and obviously, most people don't have groups that large, but I encourage everyone that I work with to have a, at least a couple, few volunteers, if they can find someone that's medically trained to some degree uh, to be there to assist if an emergency ever happens. You know, again, it's all a sliding scale, you know, because people ask me, oh, is it required that I have like a medical doctor on staff? And I said, yeah. No, not necessarily, but any of those extra things. But it wouldn't hurt. (laughs) Yeah, it wouldn't hurt, no doubt. And so I tell them, you know, any of these extra things, because they'll tell me like, oh, well, I have a friend that's a nurse who's reached out and wants to help, uh, you know, be here, you know, during the summer. I say, all of that's great. Like, get those people involved. Um, And one thing I was going to say earlier, I actually talked with a neuroscientist um, about three weeks ago at a place in Houston. Uh, They were actually having a music – uh, workshop that weekend, but normally they do ceremony. Um, Hmm. but he told me, he said, look, I've been doing neuroscience for, you know, over 20 years, but he said, it's my opinion now that the human body cannot fully heal from a physical malady. Um, if the energetic bodies are not in alignment and, and freely flowing. And he said, you know, when I drank ayahuasca, I came to this realization and, He's been seeing this. He's he's had a few patients who've engaged with the medicine, and he said that it's kind of playing out right in front of his eyes what he's talking about, that mm. the spiritual, energetic body is just as important um, as the physical uh, to overall health and that the physical actually responds to this metaphysical one that, that we can't necessarily see. Oh, for sure. Can I take that one step further? Yeah. <laughs> I, I have long believed— and this is a little bit of a nod to Terence McKenna and um, his stoned ape theory. But I have long believed that humans evolved specifically to be ingesting these things. Not not mm-hmm. in the sense that it's an essential nutrient, like you would die mm-hmm. if you didn't have them, because yeah. clearly we don't die if we don't have them. So it's not like, say, on the same par as a, a vitamin or an amino acid. But I think maybe there is an argument to be made that because we grew up through uh first you know a jungle-based agricultural society and yeah then, you know stayed agricultural until the modern age that these were probably things that were in our diet more regularly than we realize mm-hmm. and we probably evolved uh specifically to deal with them it's in part like for example why humans have an endocannabinoids cannabinoid system you know what a shocker mm-hmm. that we all react really yeah. positively to cannabis guess what yeah we're specific evolved for that. And I think that uh, there is a strong possibility that these substances might be part of like clearing the brain. And I think over time this might be revealed. And it won't be, again, on par with a vitamin, but maybe as essential a nutrient as a vitamin. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree. And it's just, you know, and it's weird how it works because it's the profundity of the experience kind of gets you clear mentally and, and has you kind of what I feel focused on the right things. Um, and then also too, you have this metaphysical energy aspect to it where, you know, there's been certain times in my experience where this just amazing flow of energy is pulsating through my body. And, and I, I tell people I convulse, but it's not like a seizure convulsion, right? It's just kind of like shaking more or less, but it's, 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 it's not nefarious in any sense, you know, and yeah. um, I feel like my energy is correct after that experience. And I just feel a certain level of happiness and healthiness that I've never gotten necessarily going through a, a Western doctor. 
And that's yeah. not to say anything bad about them, right? It's just, again, I think that these substances hardwired in our brain. I, and I think the science shows that our brain knows exactly what to do with it. It, it doesn't like, you know, reject it or anything. It, it goes straight to the receptor sites uh, and starts to work its magic uh, unabated. Yeah. Yeah. And so for the young budding scientists at home, another opportunity yes. for yes. a thesis. So go get your PhD on that, kids. Seriously, we need it. I would love to read the paper. <laughs> As would I. <laughs> yeah. And, and I guess what you were kind of alluding to, too, maybe be briefly touching on McKenna's stoned ape theory in a sense. Um uh, that, you know, we evolved at a very early time. Now, now let's put the evolution, you know, the, the, the quick evolution part of it aside, but, you know, the probability that these were part of our diet and probably more than likely part of our early religious practice as well. Um, you know, and, and one thing I tell people, especially with like the mushroom churches and stuff that I deal with that aren't necessarily tied to a lineage, you know, there's so much evidence out now of, you know, pre- you know, prehistoric lore. So, but, you know, late or long time ago, mushroom use, you know, that, yeah. you know, trying to say that, that this isn't tied to anything. It's, it's, I think that's slowly going out the window. And, and two, you know, we know that like the Christian missionaries, you know, basically eradicated in South America, in the Americas, at least all of these, you know, uh, uh, entheogenic uh, consuming religions but they could have done that all over the world. You know, I, I doubt that this was the only instance here where that happened. Right. So in reality, we might not ever know the full extent of prior religions that oh, engaged. in these, Yeah. These the, the, the Spanish, when they invaded South America and, and crushed the Aztecs and, and their religion, um, burned all the codices. The, mm -hmm. the, the Aztecs had had all of this stuff written down. And, and it all got burned. <laughs> they destroyed uh, yeah, the libraries. Yeah. So all of that knowledge was lost. I think there are like just a few codices that survived into the modern age. And I mean like fewer than 10. And they're in private collections or private libraries around the world. Um, and some of these do mention mushroom and, and other substances. Mm -hmm. So just imagine what we lost. Uh, and yeah. You know, there's that edict that was handed down by the Inquisition, deeming the peyote in particular to be uh, the devil. You know, literally diabolical was the word. And it was stamped out. And, uh, you know, these ancient people were, were not ancient, but 1600s, were burned at the stake alive for using these substances and promoting them. And this was a way of subjugating an entire civilization by wiping out their religion. And so literally what we know now is merely just a residue of yeah. what once probably was a very widespread, absolutely accepted, you know, mainstream for that time thing. Absolutely. Wholly agree. And, and I'll tell you, there, there's a guy who right now, he's actually got a Facebook group uh, who wrote the Sacred Mushroom Ritual book mm -hmm. that apparently some archaeologists have either discovered more codexes or been able to interpret some yeah. of those codexes uh, in a way where now they have even more insights into what that experience was for these people yeah, and what that meant, uh, you know, in, in relation to it. Yeah. Like, for example, I, I was able to find a replica of Mayan oh, mushrooms. Oh, wow, yeah, that is cool. Yeah, I've got, I've got two of them. And this is a direct replica of one of the mushroom stones. So mm -hmm. in the absence of writing, you know, archaeologists have to kind of piece this all together. And so there are hundreds and hundreds of these mushroom stones. And people, uh, you know, when they first found them, didn't know. I guess the earliest scientist, I forget his name, he was some dumbass archaeologist who thought these were dicks. I'm not kidding. He thought yeah, there were hundreds yeah. of statues of dicks. Uh, and that's what the predominant belief was for a long time until somebody came along and said, uh, no, you pervert. It's a mushroom for God's sakes. What's wrong with you? It so, looks curiously like these ones that grow wild in the region that happen to be, uh, you know, psychedelic. Yeah. And that's mushrooms, not psychedelic dicks, folks. Yeah, that's right. Well, maybe yeah. it depends on who you are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I think it's just a testament to. You know, the Christians wipe these people out. Now we're on a mental block that, you know, this can't be real or something that was ever widespread or, or ever accepted to such a degree yeah. that people made these beautiful pieces of art in reverence to, you know, these sacraments. Um, there's just a mental block on it. But, you know, and again, reading this research, you know, which a lot of people can get behind. 
uh, because it's been done, you know, under certain conditions that, you know, the, it's primary religious experience, right? So no matter what you say, we, we do have plenty of evidence to note that these are religious experiences. And so at least to a certain degree, you have to admit that these people's experience is valid. You know, whether you believe what they're encountering or experiencing is real or truthful, which the court can't even concern itself with, mm-hmm. the existence of that nature of experience is, you know, can't. I'm not saying it can't be doubted, but for the most part, the research, you know, buttresses that, that assertion. For sure. All right. We're, we're closing in on two hours here. How okay. are you, are you free to keep talking or I don't want to abuse yeah, the privilege? Yeah, I mean, no, talking. that's fine. Um, I got probably about 15 more minutes. Okay. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about your, uh, your new real estate? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, by, by the way, use, use the last 15 minutes. We're together. Plug anything you want, man. Just okay. Okay. abuse yeah, yeah. abuse the opportunity. I do not mind. Yeah. So um, and if you if you get a chance to go and check out the the Bufo Five Meo videos on Theo Connect's uh, webpage, uh, the gentleman who is the subject of you know going through the ceremonies is an older African American man who I've since befriended. Um, and so me and him, once he kind of came onto the path, we decided that we wanted to get a piece of property. I, for me and him both, we were just wanting a place to kind of get away, right? Because we both live in town and we're both nature lovers and agree that for mental health and overall well-being purposes, having kind of a getaway spot is, is something to be desired. So, yeah, so we got this beautiful piece of property. It's, it's three acres. It's a nice, beautiful pasture with a pond and in the back. Uh, I guess 17, 18 acres is all wooded with a creek that splits the middle of it. And, nice. you know, our uh, our goal is to, you know, spruce it up and, and possibly hold some ceremonies and other retreats out there, you know, whether it be meditation retreat, yoga retreat, but just a general spiritual religious health center, you know. So, um, yeah, that's the goal. And, you know, for me, I'll tell you this. When we first got it, I just spent a whole Saturday just walking through the woods and cutting trails. Um, and I tell you, just, it's the one place I can go where when I walk in the gate, like all this happening out here doesn't even cross my mind and and it's just very therapeutic. So I have, I have high hopes for that. I, um, you know, just a project of mine that I hope will, will benefit people. I will say that, you know, New Orleans right now is fighting for a decriminalization measure and it looks like it's probably going to pass. Um, and me and some other individuals are getting together to try to get as many inner city, um, you know, minorities to come, you know, on their own free will and volition, but to come and possibly participate in these medicine ceremonies, uh, just to spread the love. You know, I, I tell people, you know, when I experienced this cosmic unity, like it really meant something to me that that we really are all one. And, um, you know, reaching out to these people and, and giving them an opportunity to come and, and and sit with the medicine, I think is, is you know, just kind of a mission of mine. I, I'll say that you know, most times when I go to ceremonies, just to be honest, it's, it's mostly white people there. There are some other nationalities and people that show up from time to time. But I don't think it's necessarily because well, I know it's because nobody doesn't want those people there. It's just there isn't as much outreach and knowledge in these other communities. And so um, my goal is to kind of do some education. And eventually, if they feel so called, you know, some invitations to come sit and just kind of widen, uh, you know, this movement even further. Um, and so that, that's my goal with it. And obviously my, my partner on it, um, he's a good talker and he's, he's a spiritual man. And I, I feel like with, with him also speaking and educating with me, uh, that we'll be able a little bit more successful at, at, you know, rounding some people in. So yeah. that's that, um, on top of that, you know, obviously I had the Entheo connect platform. Unfortunately, when we first published it, and, and let me just say briefly, in Theo Connect, I envision it to be eventually a platform where people can go on and find reputable uh, uh, medicine churches, right, that that have done their paperwork, have done the legwork to do everything they can to get on the higher protected end of the spectrum uh, and and have some safety standards. You know, in, in working in this, this space, I, I have a pretty good feel uh, of where people could should potentially be led to right i'm not this isn't going to be a website where 
someone had an experience last Saturday, now they got them some medicine and want to serve, right? This it's going to be a vetting process to this, but, and then also to other practitioners, you know, integration specialists, yoga, meditation, all these other ancillary things that go along with it uh, in one spot with an interactive map. Um, Eventually I envision it to be a global thing. Um, But unfortunately when we first published it, our developer, I don't think understood the breadth of the project initially. And so we've had to kind of switch developers now who are more apt to be handle, you know, a project of this size. And um, so uh, right now, I think we're close to be a month or two out to be back up and running full steam. And, uh, you know, again, I, I really want to help the people initially coming into the space for sure, because I know that they're stepping into this not knowing a damn thing, you know, yeah. so I, I want to be able to have a, a, a reputable place where they can say, OK, look at all these different places, you know, have bios of everybody in the church and all that and try to help match them up with the place that's right for them. Um, so. Again, we're working on it. That's about a month out. On um, on the litigation end, I'm working with a gentleman, Ian Benoit, who is, uh, as a matter of fact, he was the first veteran to ever go to Mexico to do the Iboga uh, uh, 5-MEO treatment and then has since worked on several 501c3 organizations helping veterans get access to the medicine. But he's been in these circles and in the medicine space for almost 25 years, if not a little bit more. So me and him have kind of partnered up uh, doing these church projects because he obviously brings a, 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 a invaluable point of view to this, but our next goal, Gary is starting in the fall. Him and I are both going to apply uh, to the Southern district of Texas. And we've honed in on an, an ayahuasca church in Texas uh, that we feel uh, is going to make a really good case and a straightforward case, you know, uh, with with a South American lineage and an actual person here that runs the church. Um, so I think we're going to dip our toes into the litigation game uh, here coming up pretty soon. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was, I, time permitting, I was going to pitch you on another harebrained idea of mine. Yeah, yeah, let me, no, let me, let me, let me do it. Um, it. so I was thinking, why not just file a simple, clean, federal declaratory judgment lawsuit? Get an organization, put all your issues in the lawsuit, start fresh so you're not having to inherit somebody else's lawsuit that's got, you know, a little hair on it, um, and see if it can't proceed that way. I'd have to think it through all the way, but for listeners at home who don't know what I'm talking about, if you're not a lawyer, you probably don't. Um, you normally cannot file a lawsuit seeking an advisory opinion. You, you can't go and say, hey, judge, I don't actually have a problem today, but if I were, what do you think you'd say, buddy? You can't file that. But there are federal and state correlative laws that allow for what are called declaratory judgments, where you can go to a court and say, hey, I, I've got this statute that I'm not exactly sure if my behavior complies or doesn't, or I've got a contract and, um, you know, we think there's an ambiguity here and I don't want to do something that might put me in breach, but I'm not entirely sure what my behavior is supposed to be and I'd like to be compliant so I don't get in trouble. So can you, court, tell me, am I reading the statute correctly or am I reading this contract correctly? How do you interpret it? And you can get a, you can get a declaratory judgment in those limited circumstances. So the thought was, why not pitch a court on that very notion saying, hey, we'd like to have this psychedelic group moving forward, doing certain practices and behaviors. We're being told by DEA that we can't, and, and we certainly don't want to run afoul of the law. Uh, but we also at the same time believe that we're not. So before anybody does get criminally charged, because we'd really like to avoid that, can you tell us if our proposed behavior is or is not legally, constitutionally acceptable? Um, I yeah. think that's a great way to go because then nobody gets in trouble and you can frame the issue so cleanly because you can dictate all of it instead of having an incident where you're merely having to address the incident. Yeah, and, and look, you know, for just your standard ayahuasca church, right, with the UDV and Santo Dame opinions, I mean, the court's not going to need to reach if at all, too far outside of the pleading, as long as you attach the proper documentation to prove up, you know, some of the other things that you're going to need to prove up. Yep. Um, They're not going to have to reach too far outside of that to make a determination. And I I feel like, you know, again, without an incident, that is just a pretty straightforward thing, really, you know, I mean, uh, at least with an ayahuasca church, right? So 
and you could file that for other churches, but it might not be as clean of a in and out type deal, right. you know, as an ayahuasca church would be, but still, uh, nonetheless, a very valid move on the part of a, of a riffer plaintiff yeah. um, to, to seek that. And, and by the way, you'd want to file that suit hoping you lost. And I know that sounds wacky. Why on earth would you file a lawsuit you want to lose? Because you want to get the appeal. You want to get the appellate case because the appellate case is what makes binding law in that mm-hmm. jurisdiction. And then, if you're ever so lucky, you want to hope you lose the appeal too. And I know, again, that sounds weird. Why? Because yeah. you want to go to the Supreme Court and get cert because that's the ruling that matters. You know, I wonder if on a straightforward ayahuasca church, if they would even uh, – well, possibly they would grant cert, I guess, if they feel like the appellate court got it wrong and wanted to mm-hmm. speak on the issue. Yeah, yeah, particularly if it interrupts the existing rulings from the Supreme Court. And there are at least enough of those that you can make the argument, for sure. Mm-hmm. Anyway, yeah. so no. my, my wackadoodle pitch to you, sir, is no, contemplate it, it, a deck yeah, action. I'll, uh, you know, now that you kind of fed the nerd in me, I will take a look at the <laughs> You've got one, too? <laughs> And just see the validity. I, I'm telling you, I nerd out on these things. You know, I, I do a lot of federal court litigation, the maritime practice. So I'm very familiar with the rules and all that stuff. Not necessarily a declaratory judgment per se, but it's now that you put the bug in my ear, I'm definitely going to take a look to see uh, if that's a, you know, a viable uh, procedural device to use in, in this scenario. And kind of, like you say, think out the, the ramifications of, yeah. of the different results. Um, but yeah, I mean, Again, I, I think Ian and I are kind of seeing it as let's get our toes wet, straightforward ayahuasca church, um, and then maybe start pushing the envelope a little bit, all with, with you know, obviously sincere, legitimate groups. Uh, but, you know, again, I would like to do one with the mushroom church in lineage, you know, um, and then maybe one that's not attached to a s- specific lineage. And then, you know, maybe do one that's that's multi-sacrament and see what happens, right? So, yeah. you know, just kind of broadening the exception. Uh, but I think somewhere in there, the DEA is going to say, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. Before we get too many, st- you know, chips stacked against us, let's see if we can try to work this out amongst us, you know, because, yeah. you know, again, the more cases that they lose, the more empowered people get to actually exercise their rights. Um, and you know, that could possibly be something that they want to prevent. Yeah. Oh, oh, for sure. And, and, you know, it it eats their budget, which they don't really like because they'd rather spend it on the things that they do. Um, And there's also now the the threat of the Tonson case. And and for folks at home who don't know about that, last year the Supreme Court issued a ruling in a case called Tonson versus Tonvir, which established, well, didn't establish, it confirmed, nobody believed it, but finally confirmed that RIFRA allows plaintiffs to pursue money damages against government agents. And and not just the government agency, the literal agent. You could sue the DEA agent if they stepped outside the lines. So that's kind of a personal threat to anybody working in any of those agencies. And so, yeah, I I think they live a little bit in worry or concern over that. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and I hate it. I hate to think that you know, to personally go after a DEA agent and, and start you know, seizing personal assets and stuff, you know, yeah. right. But um, sometimes those punches need to be thrown just to make the point, you know, and. Yeah. Um, you and know, I, I, I wager I, it only has to happen once. And, yeah. and I feel sorry for the guy who's going to take that shot, but, yeah. you know, look, you, you asked for it. So you took the job. Hot potato. Then they're all going to be in the DEA. I was like, I don't want it. I don't want it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to go in there and, 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 and take your side because. What question I was going to ask you, what are your thoughts on, let's say, hypothetical? We know, to the best of my knowledge, you know, SoulQuest brings in quite a bit of donations through their ceremonies, right? Mm -hmm. So if the DEA were to actually confiscate their sacraments where, let's say, maybe for a six-month period, they were unable to conduct ceremony, would it be a valid calculation of damages, money damages, Mm. the money that they lost from their ceremony donation? Absolutely. Yeah. Charles and I talked about during the interview and Charles is like all over that. And I completely Mm -hmm. agree. I, he was, he was unfolding his analysis for me and I was falling in love with it because it made such clear sense to me. I think Mm -hmm. he's spot on. Correct. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. that's when he was kind of talking like churches are in the business of making money. Like this is nothing unusual. Like, yeah, this is what churches do, and, and I agree 100%, you know? 
Yeah. Uh, look, churches are not forbidden from having wealth. I mean, anybody oh, ever visit yeah, the Vatican? That. <laughs> yeah, we see that. Um, yeah, for sure. So, it, yeah, if you're being deprived of your congregation, which is your source of income, uh, for sure, I think that's a valid damages claim. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, yeah. one hundred percent. So going back, you know, obviously an agent looking at the possible damages to because you know yeah you go confiscate their medicine they don't practice you don't know how long that's going to go for you know yeah. depending on the court and stuff like that like it could be a long time and and you got to know every weekend or so it's growing um and so could you imagine being the agent who actually followed through with that raid or the confiscation yeah sitting there in limbo for that amount of time knowing that as time passes that number is is growing Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't imagine being in that situation. Yeah, and, and look, those agents are, are people working for paychecks, folks. They're they're not wealthy. Yeah. I mean, it's a it's yeah. a it's a job you can raise a family on, but uh, <laughs> you're not living grand or lush, yeah. for sure. Yeah. So you know, yeah, the, the damage from one bad choice could be multiple factors of your annual income. Mm -hmm. What a horror show for those poor people. And so you know, we're seeing these seizures at the border you know, quite a few. And I think uh, Chakruna actually uncovered some numbers on that. Um, you know, we're seeing these seizures at the border and I can tell you there's, and I will say this is that the, the client we're going to take or plan on taking has actually had a few of these uh, seizures at the border. Obviously nothing beyond that other than a letter uh, just announcing that they're taking the sacrament. Right. But obviously those border agents who decide to confiscate that right now are, had technically have a claim accruing against them. Oh yeah. That same it, same risk to them. RIFRA does not apply to DEA only. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, my, I wonder if these agents really understand the implications of, of what could potentially uh, go on there, or yeah. maybe they're oblivious to this. I mean, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but the thought just popped in my head too. We've been talking exclusively about federal RIFRA. But mm -hmm. uh, folks, don't forget, if you live in a state that has a correlative state RIFRA, mm -hmm. um, you might want to look at the language of it to see if it compares to the federal. Because if it does, you might have an argument for a similar Tonson type outcome in your state level. You might have a state law that allows you to pursue money damages there as well. So local police agencies might, yep. in your hometown, face that same risk. Yeah. And, and I'll say this. So we're in the Fifth Circuit here, and obviously Texas is part of the Fifth Circuit, but there is a Fifth Circuit president uh, in, you know, here in the Fifth Circuit, but talking about Texas RIFRA that says that, you know, Texas RIFRA was drafted uh, with the same mindset and is intended to be analogous to the protections afforded under the federal. There you go. <laughs> so I guarantee you in Texas, it would definitely be fair game. Uh, and one other thing about Texas is that they have currently pending uh, a constitutional amendment called the Essential Worship Essential Worship Services Act or something to that effect that basically is like a constitutional provision. And obviously this was related to COVID, but hey, we can incidentally benefit and we'll take advantage of it. Um, that, yeah, it's against the Constitution for a police officer or any agent of the state of Texas to invade your worshiping, ser like your services, right? So um, if, if they were to come into a ceremony uh, and impede it, you would have a state constitutional claim uh, against uh, an officer in Texas. Uh, claim like for injunctive relief or actual damages too? No, I think it would come with money damages. Ooh. Yeah. All right. yeah. Well, that's not and, bad at all. But that plus Tanzan, I mean, it, but I will say this, Texas, uh, and, and my law partner brought this to my attention, that I think in 2010, Texas had like 15 million churches for 30 million people like filed on, on documents, Secretary of State. I mean, obviously that's not... <laughs> fully functional and operating yeah. all of them, but still on the books have having been filed as of 2010. I mean, they take religion seriously there. Um, and, you know, to be honest with you, there's only been one instance that I'm particularly aware of where um, some interference has happened and that was a seizure at the border and then a subsequent knock and hmm. uh, search warrant executed. And actually there were, the people were arrested there. Um, but that's, that's all I, I'm aware of. And they're actually still fighting this case. Um, so it will be interesting to see how it comes out. Um, they hadn't 
filed for a formal church, but we're absolutely operating uh, and have lineage and we're operating within a tradition. So um, it'll be interesting to see how the authorities there on the prosecution side uh, deal with that set of facts. Hmm. Interesting. By the way, side tidbit on Texas. I think last week, uh, Bill got introduced in the Texas legislature to legalize study of psilocybin for uh, PTSD for veterans. It, it, it was. And the, the, cause my, uh, my law partner Ian, so Dell medical school there in Austin actually got a, I think $2 million donation from Tim Ferriss. And he was asked to be on the advisory board for this committee uh, that's going to help kind of lead uh, this act as it plays out, but it was passed. And the good thing about it is that it doesn't say vets in Texas, it's vets everywhere. Um, and it doesn't say that they necessarily have to have any kind of a, a, a condition or be diagnosed uh, to partake. So it, it kind of leaves some stuff open and, and not only that, it's qualified health practitioners. So that's broad too. I mean, obviously I would imagine someone with a medical license is going to have to be uh, qualified to administer these substances. I believe it's psilocybin, ketamine and MDMA. But um, I think the only qualification is that you have to touch base with the VA, get in good with them and then share your information and your data. Hmm. uh, Because I think they're going to be the organization to, to collect all that. All right. Uh, I've, I've got a copy of that statute in, in my uh, inbox waiting for me to review it. You know, what? I'll probably do a review show on it and uh, yeah, yeah. you know, like I do. So uh, yeah. folks no, at home, I'll, I don't know when it. I'll get to it, but uh, coming soon, a review of the yeah, Texas statute. I'll be, I'm glad to uh, watch it because I, I tell you these review things that you do, it just, it keeps everybody current uh, and we can kind of see how this show unfolds, uh, you know, one act at a time. Right. Yeah. And uh I like the direction it's going. Um, I I just want to tell you how grateful I am to be in this space with with you and and a lot of the others like at Chacruna and just some of the other lawyers. Uh, Like we have the Psychedelic Bar Association now, which is great. Um, You know, it's just moving in the right direction. We've got some very intelligent, talented attorneys and other professionals that are getting involved. Um, And it just gives me hope you know, every day that, that we're moving in the right direction. And one day the tide is going to turn and we'll be on the downhill slide. Oh, absolutely. And, and make no mistake. We are the ones turning that tide. That's so. right. That's right. <laughs> well, let's end on that. Cause that was like a really okay. good high note. So ladies yeah, and gentlemen, yeah. that was the amazing Greg Lake here again is his book, the law of entheogenic churches, which I will hold up again to the camera. Uh, Greg, please come back anytime. And as soon as yeah. you have a little infrastructure there, let me know. Cause I'm road tripping to you, buddy. Yeah, come on, come on. <laughs> and I'll tell you, um, once I get this next book out, um, I'll send you an advanced copy. You can read it ah, perfect. Um, and we can come on and discuss that just in more. I know we touched on a lot of it today, but in light of, you know, the stuff I put in the book, just come and have a conversation. Oh, for it. sure. And uh, I'll share with you as well. I've, I've got my next book ready to go. Well, not ready to go. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for the cover art. Uh, but oh, nice. I'm, I'm hoping, uh, that my, will have my cover art at the same time. My new website is up, which is end of August. Uh, but a little hint of preview, the new book is called Psychedelic Arizona. And what I've got is I think 22, maybe 24 little mini chapters on Arizona's amazing connections to psychedelics. And I, I did a bunch of research and I was shocked. I learned a bunch of stuff new, uh, and I'm making it like a little tourist book. So I'm hoping to get it like, uh, in, you know, gift shops, like the airport and stuff like that. But it'll be online. It'll be on Amazon. You'll be able to buy it wherever you are. No problem. You can let the judge in the in the Ahe case read it. Maybe that'll help. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know, yeah. Get yeah. the point home, you know? A- absolutely. I, I'll, I'll just uh, share uh, one of the things I learned. The saguaro cactus, the omnipresent, you know, giant green, multi-armed saguaro cactus, psychoactive. Who oh, knew? Yeah. Who, I mean, you have to eat a tremendous amount of it. The, yeah. the level of mescaline in it is so tiny. But what an irony that almost every person who lives in Arizona has a saguaro in their front yard. <laughs> wow. So everybody's wow, got a psychedelic amazing. plant on their yeah. property. And yeah. so there you go, folks. It, they're very prolific in nature, man. Yeah. I mean, that that's kind of a testament there as to, you know, for me, at least their importance for, for what we're doing here. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thanks again. I really enjoyed this, and I hope you yeah, come back too. often because, uh, man, it's yeah. fun talking to people like you. Yeah, no, no I enjoy it too. And, uh, again, I appreciate it. I'm very grateful to be here and look forward to many years in this space push, pushing this thing along. I'll be right there with you, buddy. 
<laughs> Thank you, Gary. Thanks. Have a good night. Take care. You too. Have a question about psychedelics and the law? You're welcome to submit them. Please send your questions to admin at psychedelicalex.com. Submission of questions is not an assurance that they will be used on the show. Also, please be aware that neither the submission of a question nor a response creates an attorney-client privilege between you and the show's host, nor does an answer constitute legal advice. Information provided is for general purposes only. If you need legal counsel, you should hire competent counsel in your community. Thank you.